Welcome to another crafter noon. Although you can see today that we are not in the CHS library uh, or in my house, and I suspect many of you are as well uh, in your house, not in my house. It'd be really weird if you were in my house. Anyway, <laughs> don't worry though. Um, as Professor Maggie Mello said in a webinar that I watched the other day, uh, the home is the first makerspace. So today our focus is going to be on finding things around your home that you can use to create stuff. We are going to break things down into four separate categories. You can click the maker inventory link in the description to get a copy of this Google Doc that you can fill out if you want. And this is a modification of a tool created by Dr. Mello to help us stretch our creativity and give us a list of tools and materials that we can fall back on when we have nothing to make with but what's in our homes. So as you can see in the doc, the four categories are things to cut and separate, things to attach, things to build with, and things to add color. And I added that color category because I love color and color can be really transformative. For example, the spires that we made recently for the library escape room, those are just rolled up poster board and tape, really simple materials. But the addition of silver and white spray paint made them look much more like the towers and spires on an ice queen's palace, which is exactly what we were going for. Just as a disclaimer, before we get into this, um, as you're making your list and also as you're using these materials to create, please, please, please be careful, exercise caution, um, be careful with anything that is sharp or pointy or hot or heavy or has fumes. Um, if you're doing things with like paint, for instance, make sure you've got ventilation, all that good stuff. Be careful, I don't want you to get hurt. So here's a summary of the rest of the video in case you want to do this activity, but you don't wanna to listen to me talk for a long time. Uh, you're gonna walk around your house, your home, looking for things that fit into each of these four categories and taking note of what you have. Whether you use the Google Doc or you write stuff down on a piece of paper or post it or whatever, totally your choice. I'm gonna keep talking, giving examples that fit into the different categories, um, hopefully maybe some unusual examples to get you thinking, and maybe telling some anecdotes about these kinds of things in my own life. So feel free to keep listening, especially if you want some interesting examples, or just turn off the video now and see what you can find. I'm gonna drop a handful of helpful links in the description as well. But whatever you do, share with us what you find, what you make, because we always wanna see what you're made of. Ready, set, go. Start walking around your home. Look first for things that you can use to cut or separate. I'm gonna keep talking while you look. So get up and go now. Um, you can pull things out, or you can list them on your Google Doc or paper if you're going handwritten. But I definitely recommend actually getting up and walking around to see what's in your space. I did this yesterday, so I'm gonna stay here in my little work area and keep talking to you. Um, of course, you're gonna find the usual suspects. For instance, I was surprised when I did this to find out exactly how many different kinds of scissors and knives we have in our house. But try to be creative too. For instance, you can use floss or string to cut softer things like cheese, cake, or clay. You can use nail clippers to cut little things. Um, using a hole punch or an awl repeatedly, or for that matter, a really sharp pencil, uh, can let you perforate something and make it easier to tear. A seam ripper separates pieces of fabric that are sewn together. And your own hands and a repeated folding technique can cut paper and thin cardboard. While you keep looking, I'm gonna tell you a real quick story about improvising a cutting material. Um, once when I was in college, uh, I went to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising to get a degree in fashion design after I finished my bachelor's in religious studies. So once when I was at FITM, I was having a really bad day. And when I'm having a really bad day, I tend to treat myself to some comfort food. On that particular day, I was really craving SpaghettiOs. So during my lunch break, I ran to the grocery store that was across the street from the building where all my classes were held to buy said SpaghettiOs. And then I took the can back to school, triumphant. 
until I realized I didn't have a can opener and this was not an easy open can. There were a few teachers that were still in their classrooms in spite of it being lunchtime. So I ran around frantically trying to ask if anyone had a can opener in their desk. Of course, no one did. What a weird thing to have in your desk. This was a design school though, so there were plenty of sharp and pointy things, including several different pairs of scissors in my bag. Let me preface this next part of the story by saying, you should probably just carry a can opener so you don't have to do this. And I probably should have given up and just gone back to the store for food in some sort of packaging I could actually open. But I was determined to have these SpaghettiOs. And basically the whole rest of my day was depending on it. So I took out not my heaviest scissors because those are my good fabric cutting scissors and I didn't want to ruin those. But I took out my junk paper cutting scissors, which were moderately sharp and pointy. And I stabbed the top of the can repeatedly with as much force as I could put behind them. I was like sitting on the floor in the hallway, like stabbing the top of this can of SpaghettiOs. And I was finally able to break through the top of the can. And once I had a decent sized hole, I was able to get the scissors in like normal scissor style and was surprised to find that these scissors cut cans pretty easily once I got them in. Of course, by that time, I had wasted most of my lunch break, so I basically had to inhale the SpaghettiOs rather than savor them the way that I had wanted. But the whole thing was so ridiculous that cracking up with my friends about it really lifted my mood. Desperation can be a driving force for creativity. So, now that you've had a little time to look around for cutting implements, we're going to switch gears. Our next step is to find things that do the opposite of cutting. Now we need to attach. So go ahead and start looking. And again, I'm just gonna keep talking. Typical attaching supplies you may find are things like tape and glue. And again, these are things that I have a surprising variety of. Um, duct tape, scotch tape, masking tape, electrical tape, two-sided tape, a command strip can be used as tape in a pinch. Um, glue, we've got glue sticks, we've got Elmer's glue, we've got tacky glue, we've got wood glue, we've got hot glue, we've got super glue, like crazy amounts of stuff. Um, but did you know that if you don't have glue, you probably have what you need to make it in your kitchen? All you need is flour and water. Check the paper mache paste link in the description for this super simple recipe. And that link is kind of a cheat because combining the paste with paper and a balloon also fits into the build category. I was obsessed with paper mache when I was younger. I still think it's really cool um, because you can use these really humble supplies, flour, water, newspaper, and a balloon, and you can create really sturdy three-dimensional objects. Of course, my favorite thing to make was pinatas because what kid doesn't also love candy? For several years in a row, I would make an end of the summer pinata and fill it up with dollar store candy, take it over to my best friend's house the day before school started. We'd string it up over the swing set in the backyard and we'd use a wiffle ball bat or one time we used a broom handle, I think, to bust open my pinata to get at that sweet, sweet candy. <laughs> I've also built um, multiple solar system models, uh, a Greek battle helmet, and a handful of other things out of paper mache. Really, the hardest part about the whole project is just waiting for it to dry. In addition to glues and tapes, you can also attach things with string by tying or sewing or weaving things together. You can use paper clips, twist ties, rubber bands, safety pins, staples, uh, a hammer and nail, or a screwdriver and a screw. Even really creative folding techniques can be used to keep two pieces of paper together. Or you can go old fashioned if you have a candle and use melted wax to attach things. And while I've been talking, I'm sure you found some other things that I haven't thought of. Whew, time for tour number three, looking for building materials. Go. This category is, I think, both easier and more difficult. Easier because just about anything can be a building material and harder because well, 
just about anything can be a building material. Check your recycling bin if you have one, check your bookshelves and your backpack and your closets. The librarian at Perry Middle School in Southern Indiana, uh, Mrs. Leslie Preddy, uses the phrase kitchen cardboard, which means things like cereal boxes, pasta boxes, cookie boxes, basically any box your food might come in, or two. When I was a kid, I really liked my Barbies, and my mom scored me a Barbie mansion at a garage sale one summer. It was like six rooms, two floors. It was amazing. But I didn't have any Barbie furniture to put in it. So we started doing something my mom had done as a kid. We made Barbie furniture out of scrap fabric and kitchen cardboard. An oatmeal container was cut and covered with purple fabric to become a nifty chair. You could do that with a Pringles tube, too. Um, cereal boxes were cut and covered to make beds. There's a lot of examples out there on Pinterest now of doing that, but covering the um, cardboard with like funky duct tape, which is also a really good idea. And like I said, the Barbie mansion had two floors, but it wasn't one of those fancy ones that came with an elevator. And it also had no staircase, which like I know Barbie doesn't actually need a staircase, but it drove me crazy logistically. So I rigged up a Velveeta box and some yarn <laughs> over the top of the Barbie mansion to create a really simple um, pulley-based, fully functional Barbie elevator. And obviously you can build more than Barbie accessories with the things that you find around the house. But that was really relevant for eight-year-old me. Maybe it's something you could do with a younger sibling if you have one or a younger cousin. Um, other examples of building materials, if you are more into sculpting, but you have no clay, you can also use kitchen supplies to make salt dough. There's a link in the description for that recipe. And I use that a lot for school projects and Christmas gifts when I was younger. You can also build with wood and tools if you have those things at your disposal. Um, you can build things with fabric and a sewing machine or fabric and a needle and thread. You don't have to have a sewing machine. Or yarn and knitting needles or crochet hooks. That's kind of a funky example because you don't really think about knitting or crocheting as building, but technically you're building fabric, right? Like row by row by row by row, you're creating fabric, you're building something, and then you can put different pieces or different structures of your yarn fabric um, together to create like a hat or a scarf or socks or a sweater or whatever, you know, it's still building. Um, you can build with little things like Q-tips, toothpicks, and straws. Uh, if you have a yard, you can go outside and pick up sticks and rocks to build with. Uh, you can build a fort with furniture and blankets and pillows. The possibility of building materials are really pretty endless. You can literally build something from just about anything if you have the right other tools to go with it. All right, your toolkit is nearly complete. Time for one more tour around your home. The last thing you need to take stock of is what you can use to add color. Go! Uh, the usual suspects, you know, markers, crayons, colored pens, colored pencils, paint. But when you think of paint, do you also think of nail polish? I used nail polish to paint a rain gauge I made for my dad when I was a kid. It was pretty cool. Um, and that also leads me into thinking about makeup. But please don't use anybody else's makeup except your own unless you have explicit permission to do so. And that makes me consider different kinds of things that people used to use for makeup. Fruit juices, ash, chalk rice powder, various spices. You can use turmeric to dye things yellow permanently, or pickle juice, usually, because that has turmeric in it, too. Um, you're probably going to want to wash it after you dye it with pickle juice, though, so it doesn't smell like pickles forever. Uh, you can also use um, coffee or tea to give things a brownish tint. You might have food coloring in your kitchen. You can use that to color things, too. One of those fateful end of summer pinatas I made ended up being colored with a mix of food coloring and water because I had run out of paint earlier that summer. Um, bleach can remove color, 
but be super careful not to spill it because you can really ruin things if you spill bleach on them and you don't mean to. I did that to a t-shirt the other day. Um, gluing beads, glitter, string, or fabric onto things can change their color, as can colored tape. And if you have any chipped pots or plates or get some from the thrift store, you can mo make a mosaic of things with pieces of broken ceramic or glass. Just again, be careful with the breaking and the handling. I don't want you to cut yourself. If you go outside again, you can stain things green with grass or brown or red with mud, depending on what your local dirt is like. Um, you can use dandelions if you can find them. Rubbing on those will give you a really pretty yellow hue. Sand, beach glass, shells, things we can find pretty easily to our north. Those can also be attached and arranged to add some color to a creation. And if you don't have the exact right color for something, don't forget your color wheel. Often you'll have some component colors that you can mix together to get closer to what you want or need. Now that you've taken four complete tours of your home with different lenses on for each tour, what all have you found? Everybody brings something different to the table, so please share your ideas with us. Maybe you'll inspire someone else to think of something new too. And if you create something using this maker toolkit, we want to see about that too. Show us what you're made of. And check back in with us in December for another Crafter Noon in the CHS library. Happy making! <laughs>